Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, you get me, Dr. Janine Krause. After my last episode with Dr. Jay Tita, I could not resist doing a solo podcast. There's so much I had to say and so many things that I really wanted to get across from my side of things. Jade has very similar thought process to me, and we've seen some very similar things when it comes to the connection of emotions to health. And the longer I've been practicing medicine, the more I've learned that, man, Sometimes when you're looking to get results, you got to go to the emotions. Now, Chinese medicine has talked about emotions for years, thousands of years, in fact. And it was part of my training as an acupuncturist that there's certain organs and certain emotions. We're going to talk about that today. But really, the reason I wanted to bring this podcast out is because more and more, the older we're getting, the older my clients are getting, the more patients I see, the more complicated society becomes, the more I'm seeing emotions being the obstacle for folks to obtain health. My specialty, of course, I work with hormones, but I'm also really, really deeply rooted in helping folks age well. And if you can't get your emotions right, sometimes you'll be stuck with certain health conditions that will be your chronic conditions that won't go away. So today, I'm going to be talking about emotions and how they can be an obstacle to obtaining optimal health. So if you've been struggling with some stuff, you can't seem to drop weight. This is a big one. It's not This podcast is not going to be all about weight loss, but it is a big factor when it comes to emotions. Learn this myself. Same thing goes when we're talking about hormones and we're talking about pain. There are some deep things here when it comes to the emotions. So how did I come to really this conclusion that, okay, there is something to this emotions? Because I kind of thought like, ah, organs and emotions, it's so woo-woo. You know, coming from the Midwest, I'm one of these gals. I should have probably been from Missouri, the show me state, because more or less... I wanted to be, I wanted to like concrete proof that emotions really did cause symptoms. Well, I guess all my asking, it was granted because I started to see patterns and patterns started to evolve over time with patients. So one of the big ones that I've seen over and over again is the connection to the liver and anger, irritability, frustration, long-term pent up stuff. Now I'm going to get to that in a second, but first I better talk about how how do emotions even get stuck in the body? Like how does this even become an obstacle to obtaining optimal health? Well, what happens is we feel this emotion and most of the time these things happen when we are super young. We get frustrated about something and it sticks in us and then it starts to manifest as repeated scenarios, repeated situations, things that keep making you angry. Things that, you know, for example, if we're talking about anger, things that keep setting you off, things that like relationships keep ending in the same way, your health keeps coming back to the same thing. This is where you want to be looking at emotions. Now, how do emotions get stuck? We feel them and we are basically going to suppress them, stuff them down and pretend they don't exist when they truly do. Now, this is kind of going back to a lot of the work where docs are talking about how we store trauma in the body. I don't believe that everybody has significant enough trauma. Some of us have little T's. Some of us have big T's. Some of us just have emotions that we felt and we didn't release. I think the word trauma, like a lot of folks are saying now is overused. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. Let's, let's say we have emotions that we just didn't feel fully. And these things, I believe, get stuck around certain organs and can create some really strange mystery symptoms. 
Now, the problem as a doctor is trying to convince folks in a society that are, we've basically all been brainwashed to believe that problems in our health need solutions outside of us. Since the advent of antibiotics and at that point, anything else was snake oil, this is an issue, right? Natural medicine kind of went out the window, right? When antibiotics were, were kind of coming to the forefront, which I'm not dissing antibiotics. They are absolutely helpful and lifesavers in very, a lot of situations. What I'm getting at here is the deep-rooted stuff where you've been to every doctor, you've taken all the protocols, nothing's working. This is where we want to start looking at what's going on with emotions. But as I was saying before, as a doc, it's hard to be like, it's in your head, but it's not in your head. It's actually stored in your body. It's your nervous system. Your head is connected to your nervous system, which is very smart and stores things in certain places for I don't know what kind of reasons other than the Chinese linked them. So I was talking about anger and the liver. Those go hand in hand. Long-term anger, anger ends up being depression. Try that one on for a minute. Heart. The emotion of the heart is anxiety. It can lead to insomnia. It can lead to panic attacks. We can also have something called overjoy. In Chinese medicine, I was always like, I don't know what overjoy means. But if you think about it, it's more like mania. Thinking bipolar, right? Depression, mania. We're switching between heart and liver. Heart and liver are connected in Chinese medicine. The heart is the preceding organ to, I'm sorry, the liver is the preceding organ to the heart when it comes to Chinese medicine kind of theory of how things balance, how your organs balance within the body. Now, another interesting tidbit here is the digestive system goes along with worry, nervousness. Go figure, you get butterflies in your stomach, right? When you're nervous. So thousands of years ago, the Chinese already figured this out. Now, what goes along with this? We've got, we've got, I've already mentioned the liver, the heart, the digestive system, lungs. Lungs go along with grief, not letting things go, heartbreak, things of that nature. Now, heartbreak, yes, can go back with the heart too. Now, some of these overlap. So it's a little tricky to weed through it. But in the broad sense, you can kind of look back and go, oh, okay, that's a thing. Another big one is fear. Fear shows up as pelvic pain, low back pain, knee pain, adrenals, and kidney issues. And the organ associated with fear, the kidney. Hmm. Interesting stuff here. The adrenals, of course, the adrenal glands, which are our fight or flight glands, as, as a lot of people will think of them, they sit on top of the kidneys. So it makes sense that it would be lumped in with kidney energy. Now, when I say energy, a lot of people look at me and go, oh, doc, I don't want to go there. That's woo woo. Well, you are an energetic being. I say this a lot. We are made of ions. We are molecules. We signal with sodium, potassium, chloride. Well, those are positive and negative ions. They move things across our body. We are electrical. We have more electricity than a stinking lightning bolt. Look it up. True story there. So if we are stuck in these emotional patterns that aren't serving us, they're negative, they're down, we can drain our energy and essentially cause fatigue. A lot of fatigue when we have tried every energy drink in the universe, we've tried all the B vitamins, we've done the hormones, we've done the thyroid hormones, and nothing is changing. You want to look at the emotions. You want to look at where is your thought process? What is on repeat for you? So I've described the connections between the organs Chinese-wise and the emotions. But I think one of the other really big factors that we want to look at as a whole in the emotion organ connection system is that there's overlap between them. And sometimes one can potentiate the other. Chances are you may have had depression at one point and anxiety at another, back and forth. That is the interconnection between the liver and the heart. 
that is your emotions coming into the liver and overflowing to the heart as the Chinese principles would describe it. And they can go back and forth. You can also have emotions overload, anger, frustration, and then they're going to impact your digestive system, your spleen stomach area, as the Chinese would call it. So it's fascinating how these interconnections happen. But what's even more fascinating to me is how it plays out over time and how we have clues that something's going on. Every time someone comes into my office, I'm going to ask, oh, okay, this is your chronic symptom. This is what's going on. When did it start? Was there anything going on in your life in that time? Sometimes people will be like, yeah, this is when X, Y, and Z happened, and I'm going to have the emotion right there. Or I'm going to have to dig a little to be like, okay, so that was the time when, let's say, so let's let's go after liver for a minute because that was the one I told you I was going to mention anyway. You're going to say, so that was the time when your mom was upset with you and she said to you something not so nice about how you were behaving. Let's Let's say that. And really... That made you annoyed because you were trying to speak out. You were trying to speak your truth. You were trying to tell her something. And in that case, you were trying to explain yourself maybe was a better term. But you kind of got punished for it. Even though you were trying to do something that was right for you. You were trying to plead your case. Now, a lot of times that can lead us to having anger for not being heard, but it can also lead us to having stuck anger for not being able to trust ourselves after that. The gallbladder, interestingly enough, is the organ of judgment. And a lot of times folks will have issues with the liver and gallbladder when judgment has been questioned. And it goes way back to sometimes getting punished as a kid for speaking out in terms of how you really felt about something. Now I'm kind of speaking from something that happened in my life when my mom and I got into it and I was trying to stand up for myself in a situation and got shut down, right? And it's neither here nor there. She's not alive anymore. doesn't matter, right? But I hung on to this anger for a lot of my life and about that particular thing and not being able to make judgments without having her voice in the back of my mind on that. So I didn't trust myself. Well, interestingly enough, what kind of issues did I end up having? I ended up having issues with anger and frustration and getting quickly frustrated anger. Then it moved into having gut issues. And I still have my gallbladder, but having issues with the gallbladder and liver. Not anything crazy, but bordering on a fatty liver that actually... Now, in the modern sense, we call it metabolic fatty liver, not non-alcoholic fatty liver. It's something to think about. I'll probably do another podcast on the metabolic fatty liver situation. Stay tuned for that. It's hard to diagnose, but symptoms of pain in the upper right quadrant area, so upper right underneath the rib cage where your liver and gallbladder live, nonspecific bowel issues, mimicking food sensitivities, having trouble with fatty foods. Very interesting stuff. So, um, and then when I was trying to treat it with different herbs, different types of protocols, bug kill protocols, parasite protocols, nothing was working. These are some of the things I see with my patients as well. Now, I mentioned fear and fear being stuck in the body. This is a very common one. And fear can be so many levels, fear of, let's say, financial issues, fear of certain individuals, you know, I mean, it could be fear of anything. It could be just phobias of spiders. I'm just kind of making stuff up here. But the point with fear is that it's one of those that can really get stuck in the body. I have a patient who was recently diagnosed with a thyroid condition and a doc told her, you are going to have thyroid cancer someday. You need to take these medications or else you're not going to live. 
He didn't talk to her about nutrition, didn't talk about mindset, thought process. The same time, the same client of mine had been seeing multiple people in her family pass away from serious illnesses. So of course, there's already fear of of illness and fear of death right there. But this fear kind of paralyzed her and had her stuck. She was having back pain, having sciatica, not sure if anything was really helping her, but at the same time being told she had to take these pharmaceutical medications that she didn't want to take. She came to me. We talked it over, talked about the emotions, talked about the fear, talked about how we can relieve that. A lot of times when I work with fear in the body, I'm going to work on the nervous system because one of the hallmarks of emotions is that they often can have us feeling not safe in the body. I mean, we know on a logistic level we're safe, right? We have a roof over our head. There's not a bear chasing us. Hopefully we're in a safe living environment situation. But at the same time, the nervous system is not sure that you're safe. And the more that these emotions come up and get stuck in the body over and over again, we're not releasing them, the more that we're going to have flare-ups of our symptoms. So this particular patient and I sat down, had a heart-to-heart, really worked through her nutrition, worked through how she was going to balance blood sugar, worked through how she was going to work on de-inflaming her thyroid. A couple of weeks later, I checked in. I said, hey, how you doing? She's like, I'm doing great. It just took someone to give me the confidence that I could take care of my own health issues and I'm good. Hmm. We have to be thinking about this when it comes to health. We have to be thinking about our power and that we have the power to take care of ourselves. Looking for solutions outside our body, outside of us over and over again for chronic conditions that we've evaluated up, you know, up and down. And we know that we've been told like nobody can find anything. If it's getting to the point where there is no major like answer for why you have a particular condition, it's time to go within. It's time to get into the subconscious mind. It's time to go back to the emotions. Now, I am not saying blatantly go straight for that. I'm going to take it into account because I'm always as a doc going to look for every other thing out there. But the point here is you have a powerful body. It can heal itself. And it can also block itself from healing. And so if you are struggling to find answers, to find solutions, I usually will tell folks, stop looking outside of you for a solution. Start looking inside. And I'm not saying it's in your head, but it kind of is in terms of energetics. It's not your fault that this happened. It's how we were, are wired as humans to process. My client who was struggling with the fear around her diagnoses and her health has now lost a lot of weight. Her blood sugar is getting balanced. She's feeling great. This is the power of realizing I can take control of my health. I can look within and I can go, okay, I have fears. I can face them face on. And I can work to resolve them by working on things that help us to feel safe in the body. So how, how do you get to this point where you even know if emotions are an issue for you? You look for repeated patterns. Repeated patterns of things that happen in your life, like whether it's with relationships, finances, businesses, friendships, whatever it may be, your health, of course. And you go, okay, what is the situation here? And you look at those situations and go, did any of my symptoms that are chronic start around that time? And then dig deeper. Okay, if they did, then what was the emotion I was feeling at that time? Was I angry? Was I frustrated? Whatever. Does it correlate in the Chinese medicine organ and particular part of the body? One of the things I didn't mention is that the heart is connected to the small intestine. So anxiety attacking the small intestine. Didn't mention, maybe briefly, spleen stomach 
Your spleen is connected to digestive system is connected to worry. Your lung, its paired organ is large intestine. You've got grief, you got constipation, they could be together. Chronic gut issues, chronic colon, colitis, things of that nature, long, large intestine. Kidneys paired organ is bladder. So frequent UTIs, frequent bladder irritation, cystitis, interstitial cystitis, anything related in that, urethritis, those things. Looking at fear, kidney, pelvic floor, all those areas. Liver, gallbladder, I mentioned, since the gallbladder is the paired organ there. So you can see how these things interconnect. So looking and seeing what emotion correlates with the timing of your symptoms Maybe you don't remember way back when they started, but when they show up, is there a connection? Slow down, take the time to see what's going on. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happyholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not going to remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. Once you've kind of found something there, then it's like, okay, what can I do with these emotions? We're going to feel emotions all day long. We're meant to feel them, but we're also meant to feel them and then let them pass. The gurus out there say it takes 90 seconds for an emotion to come in and to let it go. I've kind of played with it. I would have to say that's true. Because anger was an issue with me back in the day, and fear seems to be one as I get older. I don't know if that's what our brains do. We start to become more fearful of like all the things that could happen, go wrong. Well, bike riding, I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to fall off and break my arm. You know, It's interesting how we shift. Could energy have shifted? Possibly. So now I'm kind of moving from the anger side of things to the fear and going, why are you so afraid? What are you afraid of? Feeling the fear and going, "Eh, okay, worst case scenario, great. Now, how do we convince ourselves to feel safe in our body when we're feeling these emotions? Number one is to let the emotion go. If you're angry about something, you know what? There's no problem with going in and like having a total temper tantrum in your bedroom, just kick and scream and pound into the pillows. There's nothing wrong with that. I know it sounds weird and it sounds super immature, but the truth is, is we are still kids. If you like gummy supplements, you are still a kid. Just saying. All joking aside, these are things that we want to be thinking about in terms of our health. Like we need to let these things go. If we're feeling grief, that's a hard one. But looking the brighter side of it. I don't think anyone that's had loss has ever imagined that their loved one would love for them to be suffering. Of course not. But we have to look at why does this not feel have us not feeling safe in our body? What is it? What's going on? So one of the biggies is looking at how Can you set yourself up for feeling safe? Because emotions will come, but so will aches and pains. I have now, and this might be why I've shifted more into the fear side of things, is because I have a L5-S1 disc that's ruptured. And it causes a lot of back pain sometimes, certain times. But if I look back at the certain times, there's going to be correlations to more things that are coming up for me that had me feeling fearful. Whether it's a new venture in the business, whether it's some finance stuff, we want to explore these things and go, okay, what can I do with the situations that are coming at me to help me feel more safe? 
Same things would go if you're someone who feels like every health thing that happens to you really sets you for a loop. I know some folks that that happens and, you know, while they may characterize themselves as being somewhat of a hypochondriac or maybe their parent, their mom or somebody was like that, so they're trying not to be that way. Hey, your body's still signaling with it because it's a it's a learned pattern. And if you're feeling like every little health thing kind of sets you off, you do want to look at it and go, okay, how can I see this thing for what it is? And what can I do to help me feel safer about this neurologically? How can I have this issue not set off my nervous system? So for some folks, if we're looking at, let's let's go to the thyroid, because that's a pretty common one for folks to have a diagnosis now of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is autoimmune thyroid condition. It's very common. It can be very scary. I've got antibodies to my actual thyroid. So my body's trying to attack my thyroid or it's trying to attack the an the enzyme that converts the T4 thyroid hormone to T3. What do we do? What do I, you know, where do I go from here? Well, we want to be thinking about, okay, this happened. What's the emotion that goes with the thyroid, by the way? Well, interestingly enough, it's not speaking your truth. And not speaking your truth kind of goes along with a couple overlaps there. It goes with liver, goes with heart. Some folks would even argue that there's an overlap with the digestive system with thyroid. So we have to look at the intricacies. We've got thyroid, but what's the other symptom along with it? Is it fatigue? Is it gut issues? Is it hair loss? Then I would be going more towards the digestive system side of things. Is it more anxiety? Is it more frustration? Anxiety, heart, frustration, liver. Now, granted, those are the organs. How do we feel safe when we've got a chronic condition like the thyroid issue going on? Well, looking at where can you speak up? Because where you've not spoken up, where you've not used your voice, where you've not been able to be you is likely where your body's feeling not safe and provoking the thyroid condition. So Tita, Dr. J.T. Tita mentioned the mud the misguided unconscious decisions that lead us to where we are repeating patterns. A lot of times I'm going to have folks with the thyroid conditions look back and see where they have not used their voice, where they've played it small, where they have deferred to someone else and just kind of followed, and even though they wanted to say something or speak out. Look at those situations. Where have you made some misguided decisions? Those might be the places in which you're not feeling safe in your body. So clues. Once you can identify them, then you can work to help gain security. For the thyroid, it's gaining security around who you are and what you stand for and being able to feel confident to speak up. Now, for a lot of people, that may seem like the most terrifying thing in the world. Working with someone who's a specialist in this department can really help. This podcast by no means will solve any emotion, organ connection issues with one podcast. I, I wish it could. I wish I could give you one tip to help you feel safe in your body. It's just not that easy. There, It's a process. Now, there are certain techniques that can help you. There are nervous system techniques to help you feel safe or to ground you. Some of my favorite come very simply. One of my favorites is called havening, taking your hands and you're just kind of rubbing them on each other so that you feel one hand squeeze the other hand. And if you're able to watch this, you can see what I'm doing, just, just really ringing. It's kind of like wringing my hands. Now, there's also something called hand skating, just literally taking one hand, sliding it over the other. That can be another nice nervous system calming tool. Along with these come tracing the lips, lip glossing. And then you can also take your tongue and rub it over the front of your teeth in something called teeth cleaning. You keep your mouth closed, but <laughs> what I said was you rub your tongue on your teeth and you clockwise six times or so. Now, I've learned these from someone called Kate Normthrop. I'm in a program of hers where I learned a lot of these. I've also learned some other things along the way. 
um, and different other groups, there's more than just these. These are just a few tips that I like to share with folks. But when it comes to the nervous system and feeling safe, you have to find what works for you. Now, I just kind of rattled off what I've learned from the fabulous Kate Northrup, but you can also do emotional freedom technique, tapping techniques. So tapping on the side of your hand here, using acupuncture points, you can tap on the top of your head. There's a sequence. I did a podcast with Brad Yates all on that. I also did one with Teresa Lear Levine as well. Both fabulous folks. I will link in the bottom of my show notes with, to drjcarlsnd.com for you to check out those folks and the tapping techniques we went through um, for them because both of them have extensive networks of videos that are for free that you can watch. Brad in particular on YouTube, Tap with Brad. You can see how he taps through anxiety. You can see how he taps through certain fears, certain things that come up. This is huge because this is another way to help you release that emotion and feel safe in your body again. And I know this may sound like super cheesy to folks. It did to me for a long time till I really started to realize how much our nervous system will impact how we think and then impact the organs. It's kind of like the emotion comes in, the nervous system takes the hit the emotions pop off and then our immune system and our endocrine system have to figure out what to do with that. And this is why I think we have so many folks who have chronic autoimmune random mystery illnesses, but I also think it's why we we have a high, high rate of mental illness. I think it's why we have a high rate too of neurological stuff going on. There's a very interesting connection between your brain and your endocrine system, your immune system, and your neurological system. I think it's why we have a lot of people with thyroid issues and why we have a lot of issues with weight. Most of the people that I see in my practice who are overweight and keep gaining weight do not eat that much food. It is mind-blowing to me. There has to be something else in the way. Yeah, we can blame things on cortisol a lot and we can blame them on hormones and we can blame it on thyroid and this and that, but there's an obstacle. And one of the biggest obstacles I see in terms of a pattern for folks to get results is this whole concept of feeling safe in the body and the emotional organ connection that really does impact your nervous system, how you process your endocrine system, so how you process things, how you signal. Having worked with hormones for quite some time, I find that it's mind-blowing how many folks we can give thyroid medication to and nothing happens, like nothing. All we see is shift on the labs, but they don't feel any better. Well, I'm not interested in treating labs. I'm interested in treating the person. Same thing goes with hormones. We can get great shifts on hormones and labs when we supplement people with hormones, but they don't feel any better. Why is that? Yes, we have to go back to the gut. Yes, there's foundational health issues, right? We need, we need to always have a healthy gut, eating clean food, having clean air, having clean water. That's all incredibly important. But also looking at what is going on in your subconscious mind and your repetitive thoughts and your repetitive behaviors and patterns. These things are almost, I think, it, as important as working on the gut. A lot of people are going to be like, no, the gut has to happen first. Mm -hmm. It's, I find that it's, it's an obstacle to cure. In Chinese medicine, they talk about it. In naturopathic medicine, the type of medicine that I have training in, one of our principles of being a doctor was to identify the obstacles to cure. Jade, Dr. J. Tita mentioned it in our podcast. And, you know, we don't, you go to school, you learn the principles, right? Like in the first year of school. And by the time you're out, which I'm like 17 years out now, you forget about that kind of stuff. But you think back and you go, oh my gosh, one of the biggest obstacles to optimal health is what's going on in our psyche and how we process 
our thoughts and our emotions. And I'll call myself out on this one and, and really give you guys another way to kind of wrap this up. I've struggled with my weight on and off for probably almost my entire life, and at least in, from when I was eight years old, because it was drilled in my head that I was getting chubby. I was going to look like my mom or my Aunt Marion by my father. And he was doing the best he could with his information. He was trying to keep me, you know, from turning into being overweight like most of my mom's side of the family. That statement stuck in my head. It stuck in my head that you're always going to have a slow metabolism. You're always going to be large. I watched my mom struggle with her weight. I dieted with her since I was probably eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in that range. She'd be on a diet, I'd do it too. Because I had it stuck in my head that I needed to keep working on this. Talk about mud, like Jade said, the misguided unconscious decisions. I jacked with myself so much in terms of my brain and my endocrine system. I didn't eat meat partially because I felt bad for animals, but also partially because I had in the back of my head, maybe I'd lose weight in high school. And because, okay, let's be honest, my mom also really sucked at making food. <laughs> she was not a good cook. She microwaved all the meat. And I would eat, we had a lot of venison because my dad was a hunter. Venison <laughs> marinated in Italian dressing is disgusting. Um, to this day, Italian dressing and I, we do not get along. But the point I'm trying to make here is I associated food with making me fat. So for 40 years of my life, I really had an issue in my head of every time I ate, I always thought, what is this going to do to me? Think about that impact on your metabolism and your endocrine system. Of course, I never was able to get to this weight, this imaginary weight I wanted to be at. Of course, I struggled with getting to be leaned out like I wanted to be. So now I realize that, right? I look at it and I go, okay, I, my anger, a lot of anger around food. A lot of anger on things with mom. Tie that, wrap that up into some stuff for you. <laughs> but really where I'm getting at this is it came to a realization with working with one of my coaches when he was like, if you think you're never going to be able to lose weight and get to a body that you want with all of the work you've been doing, you won't. If you think you can, you will. It seems so simple. But think about all the things we've thought about and interfered with our health. When it comes to aging, our only vision of what aging looks like is our parents. And if we didn't have parents in our lives, our, our guardians. And now we have what society looks like. Sure, there's folks defying aging left and right, which is awesome. But deep down, do you look at those folks and go, I could never do that? If you do, this is where we want to think about things. Because so much of getting older and so much of feeling good as you get older has to do with removing your obstacles to getting healthy. Now, if you look at the Blue Zones and you, you look at the interviews with anyone who's made it past 100, usually what you're going to see is stay active, stay happy, find joy, find friends, those kind of statements. I would venture to say that most people who live well and live long tend to have the obstacles of emotions out of the way. They've dealt with them one way or the other and found a way to feel safe in their body and feel good. Now, when you're in the throes of not feeling great, it's easier said than done. I totally understand that. The point of me talking about the emotions and the connections is really wanting everyone to understand that 
you have the power to balance your own body. You have the power to feel safe. You have the power to recognize where these looping, repetitive, non-beneficial patterns are coming from. And you have the power to seek help. You could do it yourself too. You have the power to seek help to help you know, someone like myself, someone like Dr. J. Tita, to help you to take this mud, the misguided, unconscious decisions and help you to move forward in a way that's more balanced and help you feel better and more stable within your body. So if nothing else, I hope that I have left a positive point out there that it is possible to remove the obstacles that you have right now in the way that you might even not know what the heck they are. If you start looking at your repetitive patterns, the emotions, and how those impact your health. So your homework is to go and journal a little bit. Write on those repetitive things. Write on what emotions come up. Write on ways that you could turn this around. How could you turn around an angry emotion? How could you let it go? How could you feel that again if it came back up and you just process it? Just be like, all right, I am angry. I acknowledge it. I'm mad at whatever happened. I'm going to just let it go. What does that look like for you? How does that look? How can you do it? Maybe some acupuncture can help you. Maybe some massage therapy. Maybe some myofascial release therapy. You don't have to do this alone. The only part of this that's on you is to know that you have emotions creating repetitive patterns and you have multiple ways to let it go. So this is a heavy one. I'm going to end it on a light note. You have a very intelligent body and you chances are you know what you need to do to help let things go. I highly recommend seeking out some folks to help you through the process. By the way, Jay Tita has a whole program called Next Level Human, where he moves folks through a series of journaling, breathwork, things of that nature to bring what's holding you back to consciousness and let it go through breathwork and journaling. I'm also working on different things with folks too. And there are plenty of other folks out there as well, from Brad Yates to Teresa Lear Levine, that are also helping you to dive in deeper, look at the emotional side of things, and help you to free yourself from this so that you can feel safe again in your body. All right. You have the power. I'm going to leave it up to you. You've survived another episode of the Health Fix podcast. I hope you have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E, nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix Podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.